All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we're gonna jump into it. I don't have a funny introduction for you. I know you're disappointed. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now about spiritual gifts, my brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be ignorant. About spiritual gifts, my brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be ignorant. That means the Lord thought it so important that we understand the gifts of the Spirit and the working of the Spirit through our lives. Everybody say, through my life. The American church has focused on what God wants to do in my life. Does God want to do things in your life? 100%. Does God, is God even more interested in what, in what he can do through your life for others? 1,000%. He does the things in us only so he can do things through us. Amen? Too many believers stop at doing things in me. Amen, pastor. So he doesn't want us to be ignorant. So look at verse four. There are different kinds of gifts, but it's the same spirit. It's one spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord, one Lord. There are different kinds of workings, but the same God works all of them in all people. Now to each, look at verse seven, to each, to each is given the manifestation of the spirit for the what? What? For the common good. Oh, the gifts of the spirit aren't given so that I can prop myself up and look awesome? So I can start a TikTok of prophecy and tell everybody how amazing my prophecy is? No, no, no. The gifts of the Spirit are given so that the body of Christ can be built and edified. Amen? To one, there is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom. To another, the message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing or discerning of spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And to still another, the interpretation of tongues. All these, everybody say all. All All these are the work of one Spirit. And he gives them to each one just as he determines. Just as he determines. So look, we're going to talk about spiritual gifts this morning. Overall, in the Bible, there are somewhere between, depending on who you ask, 27 or 28 spiritual gifts. Okay, 27. How many of you thought there were only nine in 1 Corinthians 12? Anybody want to admit that? There's 27, there's three lists One's in Corinthians, one's in Romans, and one is, uh, uh, I don't remember the other one. Maybe it's Act, Ephesians, Ephesians. Thank you, Dr. Seiler. Dr. Seiler, helping pastor out here. Uh, there's three lists given, but there are others that we can pick up uh, in a nuanced way in other parts of the Bible and other parts of Scripture, including things like hospitality and mercy and helps and things like that. There's wonderful, wonderful gifts, but there's 27 or 28. So I want you to understand that. And all these gifts are are given to operate in and through the lives of believers like you and me. How many of you are a believer? That means the gifts of the Spirit are for you. Did you know that? The gifts of the Spirit are for you. So let's start out with this. Ten truths of the gifts of the Spirit. They're in your notes because I want you to have these. Ten truths of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Number one, the gifts are for believers. The gifts of the Spirit are for Christians. The gifts of the Spirit are for believers. If you're a believer, the gifts of the Spirit are for you. If you are not a believer, the gifts of the Spirit are not for you until you believe. Why? Because you, will, you do not throw pearls to swine. In other words, I'm not calling you a pig, I'm saying. (laughs) In other words, the gifts of the Spirit are precious. The things of God are precious. The Word of God is precious. The things that God has designed for his children, uh, the people of God in the church, are precious. And he wants them to be activated and used in the life of believers. So I'm sorry, but people who do... Now, here's here's the weird thing. 
weird thing. If you look at some unbelievers, you could see how the gifts of the spirit, if they were to operate in their life, could be powerful. Have you ever noticed that in anyone? How if they would yield their life to God and God would empower them with the gifts of the spirit, there's something in them that God could activate to be incredible work for the kingdom of God. I would use the apostle Paul as as a phenomenal example. The guy was a train wreck until he met the Lord, but the raw material of what God could do through the apostle of the apostles was there from the moment he was born. God had knit him together that way. And as he yielded to Jesus, the power of the Holy Spirit worked in his life and activated these things as gifts of the Spirit to do incredible things through him. So they're they're for Christians, they're for believers. Number two, the gifts are given for the benefit of the body of Christ and for Christ's work in the world. These gifts are given not for you and your benefit, Can I say that again? Everybody with me on that? They're not given for you or for your benefit or the benefit of your family. They're given for the benefit of the body of Christ so it might be built up and strengthened and it might go out and do the mission of God around the world. That's what the gifts of the Spirit are for. Number three, the gifts should never be divorced from love. In fact, let me give you just just a quick example. He has not given us the spirit of, but of power. How many of you know power is 1 Corinthians 12? 1 Corinthians 12, we just read the passage. It's all about the gifts of power and healing and prophecy. And these, these are powerful gifts. He's given us that spirit. What's the other spirit he gave us? Love, 1 Corinthians 13. You guys see the connection? Anybody want to say what the third spirit was that he gave us? Self-discipline. Where's that at? 1 Corinthians 14. Don't use the gifts of the spirit like a knothead. That's what 14 is about. So look, Paul wrote wrote that. He said, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but he's given us power, love, and self-discipline. And then he wrote a whole book to the crazy Corinthian church and said, guys, God has power for you, but you better connect it with love. You can't take power without love and you better do it in order. You better not get out of line here and be stupid with it. Amen. You guys see the connection? See that little thread that Paul wove? Is it wove? Wove for it? I'll go with wove. Wove for us. We can never divorce the gifts of the spirit of God from love. Number four, the gifts should not be confused with spirituality. Because someone is operating in a gift of the spirit does not mean they are spiritually mature. In fact, every one of you is on some pathway, it's at some point on the path of spiritual maturing. Amen? How many of you are you're, you're on that path? Anybody arrived yet? Anybody like figured it all out? No, nobody, no one has, because we're all in process of growth and movement with the Lord. And so we've got to understand that just because somebody's operating in a gift of, like I've seen people that I didn't even know for sure were saved. They must have been saved because the gifts are only for Christians. But, they, you know, they speak powerful prophetic words or lay hands on the sick and see them recover. Sometimes the newest Christians who have not, like, figured out how to be a Christian yet, God uses powerfully in the gifts of the Spirit. You know why? Because they haven't talked themselves out of it yet. Their own brain has not got in the way. But it's important we understand, you, you know, to be used by God in the gifts of the Spirit, it doesn't mean you have to achieve some level of maturity or some level of spirituality. It's not congruent together. So it doesn't mean just because you're immature spiritually, it doesn't mean God won't use you. God will use you even if you're immature. You just better be teachable and humble about it, but he will use you. Or he'll teach you humility through it. That's, that's always delightful. It's always delightful. But it also means just because God uses you doesn't mean you're mature. 
Don't get it confused. Number five, the gifts are often matched with natural inclinations and abilities. They're, they're ways that God has made you to, to work in the kingdom of God. And so like a lot of times people that are naturally the glass is half full are used in gifts of exhortation and encouragement. I bet Barnabas would have annoyed a lot of you non-mourning people. Because he would have come in like, what's God going to do today? And you're like, shut up, dude. I haven't had my coffee. <laughs> because he was, the Bible says he was the son of encouragement. There, there was a, a spirit about Barnabas. That's probably why him and Paul split. Because they just, you know, Paul, I don't think Paul is probably a morning person, but just kidding. So they're often matched with the way you've been designed. Number six, the gifts tend to be developmental in nature. The gifts are developmental in nature. That means that you don't have it all figured out when God begins to use you. But the more that you allow the Holy Spirit to work in your life and the gifts of the Spirit, the better you get at the gifts of the Spirit. So just for instance, if God, uh, it's only been probably in the last five or six years uh, when I, I, I have some, some gift of, of, of prophetics, and usually it comes out in sermons. It doesn't really come out in personal prophecy. Uh, you know, that's happened a few times, but most of the time it's more of a corporate kind of a deal. I just know what God wants to say. Uh, and so it's only been in the last five or six years as I have grown in that gift and yielded to that gift that I have begun to be able to recognize, oh, this is the Holy Spirit prophesying. This is not Jeff saying something that's nice. But that didn't come in the beginning. I just like, well, I think this is what I should say. And I did not have, you know, sort of the understanding or the clarity to be able to go, oh, this is a weightier thing than just I had a good thought. This is the Holy Spirit prophesying through me to a group or to an individual in the group. Does that make sense? Why? Because the gifts are developmental, and the more that you use them, the more that they develop. Number seven, the gifts are not proprietary, meaning they are not your gifts. You don't get to use them whenever you want. Paul writes that they are given by the Spirit when and to whom he desires. So I want to say it this way. Some of the gifts, hear me. I know this is like teaching, but can you stay with me? Because this is huge. And I'm going to show you at the end why this is so important. And you're like, I don't know if I can get to the end, Pastor Jeff. Yes, you can. You can do it. I believe in you. Some gifts are resident gifts. What that means is they live in your life. Like my wife, I would say, has the gift of hospitality. Okay, Maybe the gift of mercy. Those don't come and go for her. They live with her. And you know, she's married to me. So God gave her a lot of mercy. Right? And do I frustrate her? Sure. You know, there are moments where I get right on the edge of, of that mercy gift. And thank God it doesn't come and go. It's sort of resident in her. Okay? Are you with me? I'll talk a little bit in a moment about the fivefold ministry and its resident in people. But some gifts are momentary. For instance, a word of wisdom would be momentary. So if you have the word of wisdom, you, it's not like uh, you walk around Walmart and every person you see, you just know everything about their life. It's not like that. God gives it in a moment in order to advance his kingdom in somebody's life. Does that make sense? If you have the gift of me speaking messages in tongues, you don't walk around all day speaking in tongues. Like, that wouldn't make sense, would it? Paul's like, don't do that. Nobody knows what you're doing. They just think you're out of your mind. So you wouldn't do that. But in a moment, God might use you to give a message in tongues. Does that make sense? So I just want you to understand, some gifts are resident, and some gifts are momentary, but none of them do you possess. They're all from the Spirit of God. They're not yours. Number eight, the use of each gift is confirmed by the body of Christ. This morning, uh, Candace led us in a moment of worship and exhortation. Did anybody notice? Anybody notice? Candace is like, come on, people. Let's go. Let's worship the Lord. You know, let's, 
Let's lift our spirit, whatever. That's a gift. And, and Peter Wagner says the gift of leading worship is a spiritual gift. And Candace led us in that moment. And it was confirmed because the room moved with what God began to say and do. Everybody see that? Okay, good. So I don't have to beat that dead horse. The gifts are confirmed by the body of Christ. Number nine, individual, ex, individual exercise of a gift emerges from a combination of desire. Do you want to be used in the gifts of the spirit? Prayer or a personal prayer life with God. Father, please put the gifts of the spirit in my life. And need. In other words, if you drew three circles, desire, do you desire to be used in the gifts? Have you asked the Lord to use you in the gifts? And in a moment in your life, uh, wherever in the church, outside the church, is there a need for that gift? That little, where they all intersect, that's where the gift would be active. Does that make sense? So it's a, it's a, you have to be willing to be used. You have to ask God and, and, and ask the Lord. In fact, the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 12 that we should desire the gifts of the Spirit to be active in our life. So we're asking God uh, in prayer and supplication for him. And then we're looking for the need around us for the gifts of the Spirit to be active. How many of you know if you walk past a crippled child, you don't need to pray if there's a need there? If you see someone who is sick or broken in spirit or addicted or whatever, how many of you know the need presents itself? So then it goes back to, have we desired it and have we asked the Lord? And here's the reality. The need is everywhere. The need is everywhere. So it's the desire and the prayer, the supplication, the submitting to the Lord that is maybe lacking in the church. Number 10. Only a few of the gifts occur in a church service. Of the 28 gifts of the Spirit, only a few of them occur in the church service. Now you're like, what? Here's what we learn from the pattern in the book of Acts. Most of the gifts, especially the power gifts, did not happen in the church. They happened in the market. In fact, I, I can't think of a time in the book of Acts where a healing took place in the church service. I can think of many places in the book of Acts where Peter and John healed somebody with their shadow. That's crazy. I can think of other times. I don't know if teleportation is a gift, but Philip teleported from the Ethiopian eunuch to somewhere else. Maybe that's a spiritual gift, but it didn't happen in the church service. Now, does it mean God doesn't do spiritual gifts in the church service? No, that's not what that means. It just means our focus is not what God can do for us in this room. Our focus is what God wants to do through us when we leave this room. That's the focus, and that's the purpose of spiritual gifts. So we just have to understand, God doesn't just want to use prophecy in this room or gifts of healing in this room or gifts of faith in this room. He wants to use it in your everyday life outside of the church. And I just want you to know, there is no more powerful way to preach the gospel than with demonstration of the Spirit. Paul said, I'm not coming with the wisdom of words. I'm not going to try to reason and talk you into it. I'm just going to pray that God heals you and raises up dead places in you and delivers you and transforms you. And that work will testify of the goodness of God. I don't have to preach the gospel. The gospel can be preached through the power of the spirit. Does that make sense? Everybody with me? I keep asking you that, but I just want to make sure. That's the top 10 or the 10 truths about the Spirit of God. I, I am going to get into the, I wanted to get a couple of controversies. One is the controversy of cessationism, okay? The belief that the gifts of the Spirit ended at the, first, at the end of the first century when John, uh, John the Revelator died somewhere in 95, 96 B, uh, AD, that the gifts of the Spirit ended. I don't have time to get into that today because that is a lengthy discussion. We, are go we have a podcast on the Church Center app, and we're going to get a podcast going where I can go through and debunk the cessationist view. So I hope John MacArthur listens to it because he is dead wrong. And the way that he speaks about the body of Christ is sinful to me. Okay, I won't say more about that. 
but we're going to work on the controversy of cessationism in another way. So let me talk to you then. We're talking about the gifts, all these gifts, and wrapped up in those 28 gifts are what we call the five-fold ministry gifts, okay? It's in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, and here's how Paul writes it. It was he talking about the Spirit of God who gave some to be apostles. Everybody say apostles. I want you to notice one thing. Uh, the word apostle has a little a. Oh, it doesn't on there? Okay, that, that's because that whole thing is capitalized. So we're, we're yelling at you right now, okay? But in your Bible, the word apostle should have a little a. And all that means is we're not talking about apostolic success, succession. Did I say that right? Succession from the original 12 apostles. Everybody with me? We're not talking about how the Catholics believe that there's apostolic succession from Peter to the current Pope. We're not talking about that. That's a capital A apostle, uh, and we, we reserve that for those 12, 12, including Paul the apostle, and probably Barnabas the apostle, those first century. So what we're talking about is those of us that operate in the gift of apostle, uh, as he's talking about it here, in a different kind of way than those apostles. He gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors, and some to be teachers. Okay, there's five. Everybody see there's five? There's not six. And there's not four. And, I, and here's why that's important. Because so much of the body of Christ today cannot handle particularly the gift of apostle and the gift of the prophet. There are entire swaths of the world that says we're really comfortable with pastors because usually they're nice. We're really comfortable. And I'm not talking about title of pastor. You with me? There's a difference between title and giftedness. We have called everybody pastors, even if that's not their gift, okay? It's a title in our culture. So anyway, we're comfortable with pastors. We're pretty comfortable with evangelists because they own cool RVs and they drive around the country. You know, we're cool with that. Uh, and we're pretty okay with teachers. We are really uncomfortable with prophets and apostles because we don't understand them and we don't know how to handle them. Can I just say, and, and a lot of that comes from abuses through the years. Apostles and prophets that have called themselves apostles and prophets, but have abused the office. Abuse does not mean we should dismiss it. Because others have abused these gifts, if the Lord did not want them to be in operation in the church in 2023, he would have said those gifts are no longer valid. But he did not say that to us. He said he gave these five gifts, all five of them, to the church. Verse 12, to prepare God's people for works of service so the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith. Have we all reached unity in the faith yet? Okay, has the body of Christ been totally built up yet? Do we have all the knowledge of the Son of God and be, have become mature yet? Okay, or have we attained to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ yet? What? Then we need the five gifts. We need the five gifts. We're going to, I don't have time to unpack the five gifts this morning, so guess what? Beyond Sunday podcast. Uh, you should download the Church Center app. There's about seven episodes there. I'm not really trying to plug the podcast. I'm just trying to say, that's where we're going to deal with things I don't have time to work on today. Cessationism and the fivefold ministry are going to be two of them that we're going to tackle in the coming weeks. And so I just encourage you, I'll let you know when they come out. Uh, we haven't recorded them yet, but we're going too soon. So I just want you to know, God puts mantles on people. These are, if you go with me to Old Testament imagery, of that idea of when, when a prophet would, when, when, when uh, Elijah passed on the mantle to Elisha, it was a physical mantle that he put on his life. There was a robe that a prophet in the Old Testament would wear, and that, that signified that they were a prophet anointed by God. So I'm using the same imagery here to just say this, God has put mantles on his people. God has called some of you to be apostles. God has called some of you to be pastors. God has called some of you to be prophets and some of you to be teachers and some of you to be evangelists. And I don't mean go buy an RV and travel around the country. I mean, reach the lost here. Lots of ways that these gifts are exercised in the body of Christ. There's a controversy 
And I call it the controversy of exclusiveness. And I am going to deal with this for just a moment. That these five gifts are reserved only for vocational ministers. Meaning if I am a, I am a, I am a full-time ministry, it is my vocation. I don't have another job. Some people think I coach Ohio State, but I don't coach Ohio State. <laughs> I would take the paycheck. I'll just be honest with you. But, but I don't have any, uh, I don't coach anything, right? I barely coach my children, okay? So, so I don't have any other job. It's my vocation. So there is a belief out there of even if you believe in the fivefold ministry, that these gifts are reserved only for people like me or people like Pastor Jim, or people like Pastor Naren, or Pastor people that are full-time. So I'm not sure that God, A, cares where I get my paycheck, and I also don't know that God cares that much, not nearly as much as some humans do, about the credential card in my wallet. He just doesn't care. It's not a thing. God didn't invent that. He didn't tell us to have credentials. Like, he, like that's not a thing to God. It is a thing that we do for us so that we can understand, and, we can, and I get it, it's, it is what it is. But it's not a thing of the New Testament church. So what we have to go, what we have to say then is then, if Paul is right, then these gifts are not reserved only for people who are vocational in ministry. So here, here I just want to run through this quickly. All believers, everybody say all believers. And that means me. That means me. Say that too. Are called by God. All believers are called by God, and that means me. You are called by God. God has placed a mantle on your life. Here's the evidence. First, and it's in your notes, God has created each of us with a unique design. I love Ephesians 2.10, for we are God's masterpiece. Anybody ever feel like a masterpiece? We are God's masterpiece, or we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus, so we can do the good things he's planned for us long ago. How many of you know God did not plan for you to do all the same things that he planned for me to do? God did not make you like me, thank God. He's made you unique, and he's made you in his image, and he's made you to do certain things that he planned for you long ago. Number two, God has given us the Holy Spirit. The moment that you are saved at salvation, the Holy Spirit takes up residence in your life. You can read Acts 2, 38 through 40, where Peter says, you repent and are forgiven, and the Holy Spirit comes. You'll be baptized. You'll be filled with the Holy Spirit. He's not talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but that's number three. God has provided the baptism in the Holy Spirit for all believers to give them power for life and ministry. So not only does the Holy Spirit come in and take residence in our life at the moment of salvation, there is a second thing that happens, a second filling, an overflow called the baptism in the Holy Spirit that God, now is that reserved for pastors to do all the ministry? No, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is for all of you. It's for all of you. It's for every believer. God has given us a spirit to fill us. God designed us. This is the third one. God designed us to be individually a member of the whole. First Peter chapter two, but you are a chosen people. I just want you to notice he didn't say, if you have the fivefold gifting, you are a chosen people. He's talking to all of us. You are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood. Well, the, the priesthood to a Jewish audience would have been the ones that where the gifts would have resided. Okay? So he's saying, you're all, you're all priests before the Lord. You're a holy nation, God's special possession. So you can declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you've received mercy. So we're individual, but we're also in this thing as part of the whole. And lastly, God has fit the body together with unique people. How many of you are unique? How many of you are really unique? Unique people with unique gifts and unique callings as the Spirit has saw fit. God has fit the body. So I really want to read this because I think the Word of God, man, speaks for itself. 1 Corinthians 12, the human body has many parts. But many parts make up the whole body. So it is with Christ. Some of you are Jews, some are Gentiles, some are slaves, some are free. I think Paul in other places said, some of you are men, some of you are women. 
But we've all been baptized into one body by the spirit and we all shame this, uh, share the same spirit. And he goes on and he says, guys, you're all part of the same body of Christ. You don't get to say that I'm more valuable than that one or that one's more valuable than me or whatever. We don't get to say that. We don't get to say that because I am not X, Y, and Z, I'm not part of the body. Because I don't sing on the worship team, I can't uh, have the gift of prophecy because I don't do X or whatever, that, that somehow you're less than or not as important. He says, he says we, are, uh, we are all part of the body. Verse 27, all of you together. All of you together are Christ's body, and each of you is a part of it. Why does that matter? Because if you negate to fulfill the calling that's on your life as part of the body of Christ, there is a gaping hole that is left because you checked out. Because you decided, eh, I'm not that important. In fact, I'm going to show you in just a moment that until every single one of us, every single one of us, old, young, ancient, until every single one of us decides to step into our mantle, step into our calling, step into the giftedness of God, this church can never attain and achieve all the things God has designed us to do. It takes every one of us. He says he put us together. So it's a nice discussion. I hope some of that was good. I hope that some of that was revelatory to you, but why is, why does it matter? Why is it important? Why is it something that we need to work on and walk through in our life? And I want to finish in Ephesians four, just quickly, the end of, of, of the passage we read, starting in verse 13 and Hopefully we'll have it on the, on the screen. Verse 13, Ephesians 4, 13. And I want you to notice, I want you to notice how Paul addresses the church. Okay, you ready? are you ready? Because I'm going to emphasize a few words. This will continue. He's talking about the, the fivefold ministry being activated so we can become mature, so we can grow, blah, 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 all these things. He said, this is all going to continue until we Come to such unity in our faith, not your individual faith. We are in error in the body of Christ because we have so individualized our faith that we have ignored the larger part of the body. He says it's our faith and our knowledge of God's son that we will be mature in the Lord measuring up to the full and complete standards of Christ. We be mature in the Lord, not you be on your own pathway. Not you go and figure out how you can mature. Just like our culture would say, I'm gonna look out for number one. Paul's like, that's not the way this works. We have to join our faith. We have to come and become mature. Then we will no longer be immature like children. Not individually be uh, mature, but we will become uh, mature unlike children. We won't be tossed back and forth by every new wind and doctrine. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing up in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of the body of the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly as what each part does its own special work. It helps the other parts grow. I mean, do you see that if any of us bail on our calling, if any of us are like, nah, I'm just gonna come to church and go do all the things I want. I'm just gonna show up on Sunday morning and hang out for, for an hour and a half or if Pastor Jeff's really long, two hours. And then I'm gonna go do my thing. You're holding back the kingdom of God, my friend. And I say it lovingly. I'm not angry at you and I'm not mad at you, but you're holding back the kingdom of God because you have failed to activate your faith. You have failed to become part of the whole body. You have failed to, to lead into the call and the mantle that's on your life. And you are stunting the growth and the maturity of the body of Christ in this place. And you can be mad at me if you want. And yeah, I'm poking some of you in the chest. 
because you're a Sunday morning only kind of CPCer. And that is not the call of God on your life. And I'll say it this way, you're so much more than that. You're so much more than a Sunday morning sitter. You're anointed by God. You're called by God. You're gifted by God. You're walking, you don't even know, but you're walking in a mantle that the Lord has laid across your shoulders. And you're like, I don't want a mantle. Yeah, I get it. But it's the way of the kingdom. You're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. Act like it. Make a decision to press into the things and the purposes of God for your life and the call of God on your life. And guys, I'm not talking about moving into vocational ministry. I'm talking about living your calling, wearing your mantle, where he has placed you. What happens when we do? What happens when we all do? Here, I'm gonna run through the characteristics. It's not in your notes. First of all, Christ-likeness. We're no longer infants. We're, we're more like Jesus. Stability. Man, when we, but it takes us all. Some of you, listen, and I, and I hope you don't think I'm mean, I love you, but some of you are living off of my spiritual life. You're living off my prayer life. You're living off my devotional life. Why? Because the only nourishment you're giving yourself is Sunday morning when I preach. And you're living as a spiritual surrogate off of my nutrients because I've spent time with God, because I have prayed, because I have sought the Lord. Friends, that's not okay. Because what happens if I fall? What happens to you when the Lord takes me out, calls me home or takes me somewhere else? You can't live off my spirituality. You can't live off my gifts. You can't live off my anointing. You don't get to wear my mantle. You gotta wear your mantle. Your mantle doesn't look like my mantle. Your calling doesn't look like my calling. Until you step into it, we can't be Christ-like. We can't find stability. Then he says, we'll be able to speak the truth to one another with love. It's a work of the Spirit. He says, we'll be so interconnected that we will together in all things grow up into him who is the head. There's an interconnectedness that happens. If Paul's right, then what we're seeking as a church, what we want, a this is what I think God wants us to be, a strong, preserving faith. We want, he wants us to have a strong, preserving or persevering faith, equipping people to be authentic followers of Jesus, helping people walk with God, helping people know their calling, helping people find their giftedness, helping people walk in the mantle he's put in their life. It will never be achieved until every one of us decide to start walking the pathway. Too many people are trying to be something they're not. Too many people are still disengaged from the call of God. And look, I'm not talking about serving in kids' ministry, though we could use your help. I'm not talking about just filling our ranks and filling our roles. I'm talking about walking in the call of God tomorrow, wherever you go. I'm talking about laying hands on the sick because God has put it in your heart to heal. I mean, I'm talking about living it every day. We don't get to do it our way. We signed up for this Jesus thing. If you signed up for this Jesus thing, you don't get to decide because you're not the king. And the last guy who thought he could become king is the guy that gives us all trouble. You get to submit to the things of the Lord. So I, look, I just, for me, I know it's spiritual gifts, but for me, it's just kind of like a line in the sand day. I think God has incredible plans and things that he wants this body to accomplish, but I can't do it without you. I don't want to do it without you. That's not the way the Lord set this thing up. So I don't know what 
you have to get beyond. I don't know what you have to get beyond. I don't know what you have to be healed from. I don't know what God has to rearrange in your brain or your heart or your spirit or whatever. I don't know what you have to get past to, to begin to engage your call and wear your mantle. But I know this, if you'll make that decision, be the best decision you've made in the last five years. God will move mightily in your life and you'll see incredible things from God if you'll step in your call. So my question is just this, who's with me? Who's with me? I want you to stand to your feet right now. And you're like, Pastor Jeff, I don't even know what that means. Don't leave, because I got something for you at the end here. I saved the best for last, probably not, but I saved something for the last. But if you're with me, if you're like, God, I wanna step into the mantle. I don't know how, I don't know what it'll look like. I don't even know what the mantle is, but I wanna step into the mantle and I wanna make myself available for the gifts of the spirit. And I wanna walk with the Lord and I want God to do these things through my life for the sake of others and for the sake of the kingdom. I want you to throw both your hands in the air and I want you to begin to ask the Lord, God, I thank you for the gifts of God that have been given to the church. I thank you for the mantles of God. Come on church, I don't want you to do spiritual life through me. You pray for yourself. God, I, don't, I, I thank you for these things. I thank you for the mantle. God, I thank you for the call. I thank you that I'm still a knothead and I'm not perfect and I still got hangups and I still got messes and I still got things that seem incongruent. But God, I'm willing. Come on, say that to the Lord. God, I'm willing. God, I'm willing. Put a mantle upon my life. Put the mantle over my shoulders you want me to walk in. Let me walk after the things of God. Not just so my spiritual life grows, but so that I can be the man or the woman or the young person of God that you've called me to be. Put the mantle upon my life. Put the gifts of the Spirit in my life. Release the gifts of the Spirit in my life for the sake of the kingdom. In Jesus' name, Lord, help us, I pray. Come on, would you pray with me right now just very quickly? Would you ask that for the Lord? God, release the spirit of the apostle and the prophet and the evangelist and the teacher and the pastor at Connection Point Church. Release these gifts, I pray. Release the call of God on people's lives. Those that have run from the call of God, I pray that you would draw them in. You've not given up on them. You've not walked away from their call. The call of God is irrevocable. God, you're asking them, would they engage? Would they come back so that maturity and strength and stability can come to the body of Christ? You're drawing them in. Release your call, I pray. Release your call. I want you to ask the Lord now. We're gonna close in just a moment. Lord, show me what it is that you've called me to. Tell the Lord that, would you ask the Lord right now? Show me the mantle. Tell me the fivefold call that you'd like me to learn about and step into what it is that you'd like me to do. God, as I wear the mantle, whatever it is, as you begin to lay that across my shoulders, Lord, that I would with boldness step into that calling, step into that anointing, step into the giftedness that you've placed on my life and let me walk without fear, without trepidation, in power, with love and in self-discipline. Walk in the things, the spirit, the call, the mantle, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Help me, Lord. Come on, tell the Lord, help me, Lord. Help me, Lord, to do it. Show me, reveal to my heart, reveal to my heart. And last thing I want you to pray, Lord, would you remove everything that's hindering? Come on, I want you to pray that. Come on, church, it's, it's pretty quiet in here. Could you just say it out loud? Don't say it in your head. Come on, I want the devil to hear that you're stepping into something fresh and new for the kingdom of God. We're putting you on notice, We're coming for you. So God, remove the hindrances. Remove the things that tangle me up. Give me laser focus, God, on the things that you want me to do. In this, these last days, in these last hours, let me not look to the left or the right. Let me walk in the call of God on my life. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. God, I pray that you do more than we prayed and asked for things that I can't even articulate that you want to do in people's lives, I just ask you, Holy Spirit, to release it and open it in this body. 
and let us all find the way to do the things you've called us to do, to be the people you've called us to be. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. I wanna, at the the bottom of your notes, we're gonna sing a song and be dismissed, but at the bottom of your notes, uh, there's three resources for you. Uh, Catching, Catch the Wind of the Spirit by Carolyn Tennant is one of the best books I've ever seen about the fivefold ministry. Powerful, powerful book. Uh, I would encourage you to get this one. It's called Discover Your Spiritual Gifts. And Peter Wagner does a fantastic job walking through the 28 or 9 gifts of the Spirit. And then at the very back of the book, there is some notes where you can work on some things. This is about you discovering who you are and God, how God has made you as far as spiritual gifts, not personality. How many of you know we've been Enneagrammed to death? Maybe we should spend some time discovering our spiritual gifts. So I've got 75 copies of these, this book, 74 copies of this book at the Main Street Theater. They're free. I would love to equip you Uh, Please don't run over anybody to go get one, but I would love to equip you so that you can discover. So if you're serious about this and you're like, I'm gonna figure this out. I I don't care how old you are, how long you've been saved. I don't care about any of that. I gotta figure this out. I gotta figure out the mantle of my life. I gotta figure out how God has made me. I don't care how young you are, teenagers. You're not old. You're not too young to discover the call of God in your life and what he wants to put on you. How many of you wish you'd figured that out when you were 16 or 17? Grab one of these books at Main Street Theater. If we run out, I'll pray, and I pray we do. I told Pastor Phil, we might run out. If we do, take down names and I'll order you more. I don't know how many will want this. But if you wanna discover how God has made you and, and this is just a help, it's just a guideline. And then if you wanna talk about it, make an appointment with one of our pastors, come in and talk about it. Let's, let's just share together. Let's figure out how we can advance. How many of you wanna advance the kingdom of God? Man, let's, let's do this thing. I don't, I'm not interested in I'm not interested in religion. I'm not interested in what has been. Let's do the work of God now for what he wants to do for us. So these are available to you. If you already know how God has gifted you and you have neglected that gift, baby, step into it. Stop neglecting the gift of God that is in you. Do not neglect the gift of God, but fan it into flame and walk in the things that God has set for you. Amen. Amen. Lord, I pray this week would be a week of revelation for many people in this room to discover what you've done for them, how you have formed them, and what you desire to put upon their lives. Help us, God, I pray in Jesus' name as we go from this place that we would honor you and we would all fall into the line, God, in the body of Christ to do and be what you've designed and planned without coercion, without fear, without timidity, but with power, full of love and full of discipline. In Jesus' name, amen.